Introduction The traditional image of witches in Western culture combines three distinctive features a tall black pointed hat, a black cat, and a broomstick. Of course, when I say traditional, I really mean early modern, since this particular image of a witch only developed quite recently. Although the broom is associated with witches as early as the 15th century, the pointed hat isn't connected with witches until the 18th century, and the black cat, as specifically a witch's companion, seems to date around the same time, possibly even later, in the 19th century. So the stereotypical image of the witch as a woman in black clothing with a black pointed hat, accompanied by a black cat and a broomstick, only really starts to appear in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. While the broomstick is now more commonly identified as the witch's airborne vehicle, early sources did not contain this association, which isn't found until around the 18th century. In the 2013 article, A Bewitching History, Why Witches Ride Broomsticks by Megan Gannon on the Live Science website, Charles Zika of the University of Melbourne is quoted explaining that previous depictions of witch flight in the 15th and 16th centuries, quote, show witches flying on a wide range of items, including stools, cupboards, wardrobes, and two-pronged cooking forks, end quote. But they are not actually using these items to fly with. Contrary to modern depictions of witches riding magical broomsticks or enchanting brooms or other items with spells to make them fly, Zika says that historically, quote, the explanation in the theological handbooks is that they are being supported by demons and devils that are holding them, end quote. One particular feature of historical stories of witches flying has become embedded in the modern consciousness, the concept of witches using a special ointment to enable flight. This belief is typically found on the European continent. In his 2014 article, Witches Which Never Flew, Native Witchcraft and the Cunning Woman on the Stage, Dr. Shokan Rasul Ahmed, lecturer in early modern English drama at the University of Sulaimani, writes, quote, Magic ointment and flying are continental witch beliefs, when witches fly in the air or ride a broom, end quote. This peculiar feature of historic flying witch stories has been the subject of much study, and today it is widely accepted, even within mainstream scholarship, that even though these ointments did not actually make witches fly, they were made from local plants containing powerful pharmacological agents which caused the women using the ointment to experience vivid hallucinations of flight and other supernatural events, and so wrongly believe they had flown. In his 2017 article, The Origin of Witches Riding Broomsticks, Drugs from Nature plus Shakespeare, on the Forbes website, David Kroll writes, quote, Have you ever wondered, especially on Halloween, why witches are depicted as riding on brooms through the nighttime sky? The truth lies in science, pharmacology, actually, and natural products pharmacology, at that, end quote. In her 2013 article cited previously, Megan Gannon likewise writes, quote, According to legend, witches used herbs with psychoactive properties, like henbane, in their potions, or flying ointments, end quote, citing the hallucinogenic properties of henbane. Sarah Pruitt's 2020 article, Why Do Witches Ride Brooms? The History Behind the Legend, repeats the same explanation, saying, quote, rather than ingest these mind-altering substances by eating or drinking, which would have caused intestinal distress, witches chose to absorb them through the skin, end quote and citing Kroll's article in Forbes. However, there's a serious problem with this entire thesis. There's no historical evidence supporting it. This is the first of two videos examining the history of the hallucinogenic flying ointment narrative and presenting evidence that it is simply a long-standing myth. This video covers these topics. 1. History of flying ointments. Two. Ointments as hallucinogens, scholarly arguments. 3. Ointments as hallucinogens, historical evidence. Use the timestamps in the video description to navigate the content. History of flying ointments. The earliest actual reference to witches flying appears to be in Regino of Prum's De Synodalibus Causus et Disciplinis Ecclesiasticis Libri Duo written in the early 10th century. This describes witches flying physically by riding on beasts, 
but there is no mention of flying ointment. However, from the 15th century onwards, a range of historical sources consistently cites flying ointments being used by witches to fly physically through the air. The first seems to have been Roland de Cremona, who wrote that, quote, both men and women run and smear themselves with a certain ointment by which they fly, end quote. Roland claims that these reports were told by penitent Christians in confessional sessions with local monks, which is very surprising since such confessions were supposed to be kept strictly private. Regardless, in this case there is of course no corroborating evidence for these confessions. Roland himself said he did not believe them. Curiously, our next reference is not found until another 200 years later, in the 1470 work Questio de Strigis, or Questions of Night Witches, by Jordanus de Bergamo, who wrote, quote, But the vulgar believe, and the witches confess, that on certain days or nights they anoint a staff and ride on it to the appointed place, or anoint themselves under the arms and in other hairy places, end quote. The significant time gap between the citations of Roland and Jordanis suggests this was not a widely held belief during this time. Subsequently, however, we find the same story repeated in a number of other sources with rapidly increasing frequency from the 15th century right through to the 19th century. There are some uncertainties in some of these records. In the case of the alleged witch cited by Raphael Hollinshed's Chronicles of England, Scotland and Ireland, published between 1577 and 1587, it is unclear if the witch he describes is actually flying or walking. The book describes a witch who allegedly, quote, greased a staff upon which she ambled and galloped through thick and thin when and in what manner she listed, end quote. It's not exactly clear with what the staff was greased, and it's equally unclear as to whether the witch was flying or simply walking. There are several other issues with this account to which we will return later. There is also an account of a miller and his wife being charged with witchcraft in Lower Bavaria in 1600, and reference to an ointment being found in their house. Although they claimed it was a salve used to relieve chafing on their hands, under torture the wife, Agnes, allegedly claimed it had been given to her by Satan and was used to rub on a pitchfork, with which she could then fly physically after saying a magical charm. However, here the ointment is applied to a utensil rather than rubbed directly on the body. Additionally, the ointment itself does not bestow the magical power of flight. Rather, it is the magical charm spoken afterwards which provides the flying ability. We will return to this account later as well. Most of these references appear in the 16th century, during the peak of the early modern witch hunts. By the 17th century, flying ointments seem far less commonly cited, and by the 18th century, they are scarcely mentioned at all. It is significant that records of this myth appear to peak during the time when European witch trials were at their height, but fall rapidly in number as the witch hunts end and belief in witches declines. This seems to indicate a story akin to a modern urban myth, which is initially barely recognised in the public consciousness before going viral and becoming part of so-called common knowledge, before the circumstances which provoked the myth change and it then dies off as a result of no longer having any utility. This is worth keeping in mind as we review the relevant evidence. Returning to our historical records, in the 1431 Council of Baal we find reference to heretics called the Vaudois who were given an ointment and stick by the devil. Placing the stick between their legs, they are transported to a location at which they participate in satanic rituals. However, in this case, the flight is not powered by either the ointment or the stick, which appear to be used for their symbolic meanings. Rather, we are told, quote, the devil transported them to the place, end quote. A more definite reference to flying ointment is found in the poem Le Champion des Dames, written around 1440 by the French writer Martin Lefranc, who writes, quote, But whoever thinks that by broom or ointment he can fly through the air without walking on the ground, of good sense is deficient. End quote. Lefranc's view that stories of flying ointment are only believed by foolish people is noteworthy. As we will see, this scepticism was also shared by other members of the literate and educated elite. Near the start of the 16th century, Martin Planche, a priest in Tübingen, 
now part of modern Germany, preached a sermon in which he cited stories of women rubbing themselves with an ointment in order to fly to various locations at will. Plunch dismissed these stories as nonsense and told his parishioners not to believe them. Making a simple argument from common sense, Plunch explained, quote, If it were in the powers of this salve to make things fly, the very vase that contains it should also be able to do so, which appears to be false, end quote. In 1523, the Italian nobleman Giovanni Francesco Pico della Mirandola wrote a satirical dialogue in a work called Strix, meaning witches, in which he used one of his characters, Epistio, meaning the unbeliever, to represent skepticism of folk beliefs about witches. Ironically, Pico himself was a believer in witches and was attempting to criticize the kind of beliefs held by people like his character Epistio. Nevertheless, Apistio's words provide an insight into beliefs at the time about flying witches and ointment. Apistio says, quote, It seems a ridiculous thing and impossible that having made a circle and smeared their bodies in a certain way with ointment, and after having whispered certain words, these petty women take pleasure with the infernal devils, end quote. Note how in this case the ointment is not represented as having any power of flight itself. The witches cover themselves with ointment, but are only transported through the air, quote, after having whispered certain words, end quote. It is the magical words which enabled the witches to fly, whereas the actual function of the ointment is unclear. So in fact, there is no reference to flying ointment here. Additionally, even the inquisitor with whom Epistio speaks does not attribute any magical power to the ointment itself. The Inquisitor, de Casto, not only denies that the women accused of witches actually fly physically, he says that, in fact, they can be seen by others, quote, in such a profound slumber that they could not feel anything, end quote. And that it was after waking, quote, they were convinced that they had been carried to the devil's game. But in fact, they never moved, end quote. So even if any effect is to be attributed to the ointment, and again we must note that neither the alleged witches, nor Epistio, nor even de Casto actually attributes any effect to the ointment, then its only function would be a soporific, a sleep-inducing drug. Consequently, in a 1994 article co-authored by neuroscientist Dr. Daniele Piomelli and biologist Dr. Antonino Folio, the two authors acknowledged that even if the ointment described here does anything, it only has, quote, the power to produce a profound sleep crowded with grotesque dreams, end quote. Importantly, Apistio's comments also demonstrate the range of different beliefs about flying witches. He notes the reports provided under interrogation by alleged witches are wildly inconsistent, saying, quote, some, in fact, claim to be carried very high in the air, while others affirm to be carried close to the ground. Some confess to go there only with their imagination, and not with their bodies, end quote. This not only suggests there was no single established view of how and why witches flew, but also provides evidence that some witches didn't fly at all and only imagined or dreamed that they flew. By the 16th century, beliefs about flying ointments were starting to become more standardised, but an important degree of variation still existed. In 1526, the Spanish inquisitor Avellaneda of Navarre wrote of how a woman would cover herself with ointment prior to being carried into the air. However, once again, in this case, the ointment is not depicted as providing the power of flight. In fact, in this story, the ointment is described specifically as poisonous. The woman goes to a window, which was in a high place, and having called on the devil, he, quote, took her and carried her nearly to the ground, end quote. This story is of interest not only because the ointment has nothing to do with the woman flying, and it is in fact the devil who transports her, but also because, in contrast to other stories of witches ascending into the air, in this case the woman is carried down to the ground safely by the devil after using the ointment. However, it seems that by some time later in the 16th century, the actual power of flight was attributed more commonly to the ointment itself, rather than to the supernatural powers of the devil. The 2000 article, Flight and Abduction in Witchcraft and UFO Law, by John Brent Musgrave and James Huron, cites the work of 16th century sceptic Reginald Scott, who completely dismissed the idea that beliefs in witches and witchcraft had any grounding in reality. 
Scott quotes a contemporary, the French witch hunter Jean Boudon, writing of a woman who used an ointment to leave her bedroom by flying through the air, and how her lover used the same ointment and found he was immediately transported to a witch's meeting in another part of the country. Belief in this kind of flying ointment, which had within itself the power to grant flight, appears to have become particularly well established in early modern Sweden. Musgrave and Huren write that near the end of the 17th century, children in a Swedish village, quote, claimed that hundreds of them had been given flying ointment by the devil and had gone to the Sabbath, end quote. During the 18th century, Swedish stories of flying ointment attributed new powers to it which had never been described in earlier literature. Now the ointment was so strong that it would even lift items with which it came into contact. A 2006 article by Dr. Perandash Östling describes a report at a witch trial by a boy who said that, quote, if one drop was to hit an animal or object, it would immediately fly up into the air, end quote. In other reports, the ointment had a powerful inherent motive force, so that it could be, quote, put on the axle joint of a wagon which then runs away, not stopping until it is stuck in a bog or a lake, end quote. These 18th century Swedish accounts appear to represent the flying ointment's final form. By this stage, it has not only taken on its own power completely independent of the devil, it is now also casually used by non-witches in a range of practical, even useful applications. At this point, it is no longer the original mystic salve with satanic associations. Now it has become a magical concoction originally created by witches for their wicked uses, but repurposed by common people for their own benefit in more mundane applications. Flying ointments as hallucinogens. Scholarly arguments. For at least 100 years, a broad range of scholars have argued that historical stories of witch flying ointment were the result of hallucinogenic compounds in these ointments, causing the users to experience visions and delusions of flight and other supernatural experiences. In his 1977 article, The Witch's Flying Ointment, Clive Harper, Professor Emeritus of the Department of Pathology at the University of Sydney, cites the suggestion that aconite and belladonna, also known as deadly nightshade, were the ingredients in flying ointment, quote, responsible for delusions of flight, end quote. This naturalistic explanation for historical stories of witches flying is found in a variety of scholarly literature across a surprising variety of disciplines, including history, literature, botany, biology, and neuroscience. In a 2017 review article, Dr. Michael Erstling of the Institute for Advanced Studies in the Humanities at Arizona State University cites half a dozen scholarly treatments of the subject from the 1950s to the early 21st century, all presenting the case that psychotropic chemicals in ointments used by historical witches are the origin of their stories of flight and magical experiences. In 1994, an article co-authored by neuroscientist Dr. Daniel Piomelli and biologist Antonino Polio presented their own study of the ingredients in various Renaissance-era ointments, searching for evidence of psychotropic compounds. Examining historical documents of the early modern witch hunts, they concluded that some of the so-called witches' ointments, or flying ointments, could produce, quote, a host of psychoactive effects, end quote. Consequently, they proposed that the supposedly supernatural flight caused by witches' ointments were, in fact, the product of, quote, the self-administration of psychotropic substances, end quote. In his 1992 book, Murder, Magic and Medicine, later reprinted in 2000, John Mann, professor of organic chemistry at Queen's University in Belfast, similarly writes, quote, There is thus little doubt that the witches did experience flights of fancy, primarily due to the effects of hyoscine, end quote. In his 2019 article, Witches Still Fly, or Do They?, Traditional Witches, Wiccans, and Flying Ointment, Professor of English Chaz S. Clifton, who is both widely published in pagan studies and a practicing pagan himself, commented on early modern attempts to study and reconstruct historical flying ointments, writing, quote, Several doctors and lawyers conducted their own experiments, events that have been seized upon in recent times to make the case for an actual flying ointment, end quote. Mann, cited previously, mentions a more recent effort referring to German folklorist Will Erich Poikart, who used a 17th century recipe to make flying ointment, which apparently sent him and his colleagues into a deep sleep 
quote, during which they dreamt of wild rides and frenzied dancing, end quote. Flying ointments as hallucinogens, historical evidence. So we've seen the history of flying ointments, and we've seen scholarly literature arguing that some of the plant compounds in these ointments contained psychotropics, which produced hallucinations and sensations of flight. We've even seen people recreating witches' flying ointments and apparently reproducing the psychotropic experiences of the past. Now we need to dive more deeply into the historical record to identify and examine the evidence on which this thesis is based and see if it withstands scrutiny. As we've seen, this has been done before. In fact, in a 2017 article, Professor Michael Erstling of the University of Queensland writes, quote, Every few years, someone sets out to show that the alleged flight of accused witches can best be explained via an examination of the hallucinogenic properties of the supposed witches' ointment, end quote. As his words suggest, Erstling is very familiar with this field, and we're going to find his work particularly useful. We've already traced the history of witch flight and found it wasn't originally connected to ointment. In fact, witch's ointment had a separate history of its own long before it became associated with flight. Erstling writes, quote, Early mentions of the witch's ointment do not connect it to flying at all, end quote, explaining that instead the ointment commonly assumed to contain sacrilegious and profane ingredients, such as the fat of murdered infants, was instead symbolic of the witch's depravity and association with the satanic. Piomerli and Polio state that the concept of witch's ointment with the power to transform humans into animals, turn them invisible, or make them fly, quote, was tenacious and widespread in medieval Europe, end quote. However, the earliest reference they provide to any such ointment dates to 1427, which is surprisingly late. Interestingly, this date coincides with the first of the early modern witch trials and comes from the testimony of alleged witches. The Omerli and Polio quote a local priest warning his congregation of women recently accused of witchcraft who apparently said they covered themselves with an ointment which they believed turned them into cats, though the priest explained that onlookers saw no such transformation which was apparently a figment of the women's imagination. So even in this early case, we have no actual flying ointment. Additionally, the only account of this supposedly shape-shifting ointment comes from women under trial for witchcraft whose testimony was extracted during interrogation, quite possibly through torture. This is a point to which we will return later. In the article cited previously, Clifton assures us that Europeans were, quote, quite familiar, end quote, with potentially psychotropic plants, quote, including belladonna, henbane, and mandrake, end quote. As with the reference to testimony obtained under interrogation, there's a small detail here which requires closer examination, namely Clifton's reference to mandrake. Keep that in mind, we'll be returning to it later. Now let's look at some of the earliest descriptions of witches' flying ointments. A large number of the early modern sources all suggest that the flying ointments were actually soporifics, or tranquilizers, compounds which put the women to sleep. In a magical text entitled The Book of the Sacred Magic of Abramelin the Mage, the alleged author, Abraham of Worms, who supposedly wrote it in 1458, describes how a woman gave him an ointment which he rubbed onto his hands and feet, after which, quote, it appeared to me that I was flying in the air, end quote. However, Abraham goes on to mention that when the woman used the same ointment, instead of flying away, quote, she fell to the ground and remained there about three hours as if she were dead, end quote. Abraham realized she was asleep and concluded, quote, what she had just told me was a simple dream and that this unguent, or ointment, was a causer of fantastic sleep, end quote. The authorship, provenance, and original date of this text is very uncertain. Although attributed to a Jewish mage of the mid-15th century, scholars now believe it is actually a Christian text written much later. In fact, the earliest copies only date to the beginning of the 17th century. Regardless, the most important point here is that the author of this text did not believe that the ointment given to him had any genuine power of flight. Instead, he believed it was a soporific, which placed both himself 
and the woman into a deep sleep, during which they only dreamed that they flew. Although this may sound at least close to an experience with a psychotropic compound, it's important to note that in this case, both individuals are described as asleep and dreaming, whereas a hallucinogen provides visions while the user is fully conscious and aware. More firmly dated to the 15th century, we have the record of Johannes Nider, a Dominican priest and theologian who, Clifton informs us, quote, is sceptical about tales of witches bodily flying to their meetings, end quote. Nida cites the case of a woman who apparently, quote, believed herself to be transported through the air during the night with Diana and other women, end quote, but says that in his opinion, she was, quote, out of her senses, end quote. According to Nida's record, the woman did use an ointment in her alleged aerial travels, but not as a means of providing the power of flight. Instead, the woman spoke magical charms and invoked a demon before covering herself with the ointment. Eager to prove her wrong, Nida requested the woman to perform her ritual so he could witness it himself. He describes how she climbed into a large basin, covered herself with ointment, and promptly fell asleep. Nida was most satisfied, having proved to himself that her claims of magical flight were false, and that she had been merely dreaming. Significantly, Nida does not attribute any power to the ointment itself, not even any ability to its natural ingredients, which he does not describe. If anything, all we have here is yet another account of an ointment used as a soporific, a sleeping agent, not as a hallucinogen. Later in the 15th century, Alonso Tostado, Bishop of Avila, describes ointments which, quote, dull the sensation of pain, end quote, and cause, quote, such mental disassociation that man becomes separate from himself and for a short period of time feels no sensation, end quote. He later writes that, quote, there are certain women we call witches that admit to using certain ointments and ritual words to transport whenever they wished to diverse places, end quote. He does not describe the ingredients of these ointments, and it is unclear whether he is identifying them as the pain-killing and soporific ointments to which he referred previously, but the fact that he also refers to the witches using, quote, ritual words, end quote, suggests, as we have seen previously, that it is the magical spells which are being credited with the power of flight. Tostado himself never credits the ointment with any ability to make the women fly, and in fact does not even identify it specifically as a soporific, let alone as a hallucinogen. Erstling says that from the mid-16th century, some investigators of witchcraft started to suggest witch flights were, quote, a hallucination brought about through the application of soporific herbs such as aconite or belladonna, now alleged as ingredients in the witch's ointment, end quote. This is at least a step towards the modern hallucination theory. However, despite Erstling's use of the word hallucination, this wasn't quite the modern theory in its current form. Instead, as Clifton explains, it was believed, quote, the flying ointments merely produced a stupor from which the deluded user awoke claiming to have experienced nocturnal flight, end quote. Instead of the ointment causing a conscious hallucination, it was understood to send alleged witches into a deep sleep, during which they experienced dreams of wild fantasies. In contrast to the modern hallucination theory, pre-modern commentators believed that the active ingredients in the ointment only caused the user to fall asleep, and that the visions they experienced were the product of their own desires or dreams sent by the devil, but not fantasies created by the herbal contents of the ointment. This is made clear in several 16th century sources. When English herbalists John Girard and Thomas Lupton wrote about Belladonna, also called Dwale at the time, they described it as a sleeping agent, not as a hallucinogen, and cite its use as an anaesthetic in medical procedures, as well as a tranquilizer used by robbers in order to incapacitate a victim prior to stealing from them. At this time, there were also several attempts to investigate the properties of flying ointments. Mann cites Andreas Laguna, a 16th century physician who wrote, quote, a very detailed description of an experiment with a witch's ointment, end quote. Unfortunately, we do not know what was in the ointment. Piomerli and Polio write that Laguna thought its scent reminded him of cooling herbs, 
that is, herbs thought to have a cooling effect on the body's blood. Biomelli and Polio say that such herbs included hemlock, nightshade, and henbane, which they describe as, quote, powerful psychotropic agents, end quote. Consequently, they are inclined to accept that Laguna had correctly identified the ointment as potentially hallucinogenic. However, Laguna did not test the ointment, he simply guessed what was in it. Consequently, we do not know its actual ingredients. Biomelli and Polio have extrapolated from Laguna's guesses the conclusion that he believed it contained potentially psychotropic drugs, but Laguna himself does not tell us this. Instead, dismissing the idea that the ointment had any magical properties, Laguna concluded that it was a powerful tranquilizer which would put the user to sleep. He tested his theory by having the ointment used by the local hangman's wife, quote, as a remedy for her insomnia, end quote. According to Laguna, the woman immediately fell into an extremely deep sleep, confirming his theory. He therefore concluded, quote, We may conjecture that whatever these unfortunate witches do is but a dream caused by beverages or ointments which are by nature very cold, end quote. This is most likely why Laguna conjectured that it was a soporific, or tranquilizer. Additionally, his report of the ointment putting the hangman's wife to sleep demonstrates that this is exactly what he expected it to do. There is absolutely no evidence here that the ointment was a hallucinogen, and clear evidence that Laguna thought it was something else entirely. This makes sense since, as we have seen, plants such as nightshade were known by herbalists of this era specifically as soporifics, not hallucinogens. John Girard, cited earlier, wrote, quote, This kind of nightshade causeth sleep, end quote, and further warned, quote, It bringeth such as have eaten thereof into a dead sleep, wherein many have died, end quote. So at this time, nightshade's reputation was well established as a dangerous soporific, but not as a hallucinogen. Later in the 16th century, the Italian physician Giambattista della Porta also attributed witches' reports of participation in a satanic sabbath to some kind of potion or ointment rather than to the supernatural work of the devil, writing that, quote, it is apparent to the observer that these things result from a natural force, end quote. Clifton paraphrases Porta, writing, quote, in other words, lower class people are abusing drugs, but they are not necessarily worshipping the devil nor being empowered by him, end quote. Biomelli and Polio also comment on Porta's investigation into the matter, citing Porta's report of how a certain woman offered to demonstrate the ointment she used. Porta also quoted the 16th century physician Girolamo Cardano, who described the witch's ointments as entirely mundane and non-supernatural, writing, quote, It is nevertheless of natural substances that they make the witches believe to be transported through the air, end quote. However, Cordano describes these ointments as soporifics, causing sleep, not as hallucinogens, and neither Laguna nor Cardano attribute the alleged witch's dreams to specific hallucinogenic or magical properties of the plants used in the ointment. Cardano does suggest that dreams can be affected by plants eaten before sleep. However, he does not cite the traditional magical ingredients or herbs found in witch's ointments. Instead, he attributes wild dreams to extremely mundane plants, saying that dreams, quote, will become gloomy, agitated, or even frightful if one eats cabbages, garlic, or onions, end quote. Again, this is very distant from the modern hallucinogen theory. Even when citing plants traditionally understood as having magical properties and granting visions, such as mandrake, Cardano only describes their ability to put people to sleep. This view is still found well into the 17th century. The famous swordsman and writer Cyrano de Bergerac describes the witch's ointments specifically as, quote, soporific drugs, end quote, which put the women to sleep, upon which they dream of flights and other supernatural experiences. Yet he never attributes hallucinogenic properties to any of the herbal ingredients of these ointments. In contrast, people even more sceptical of the reality of witches and witchcraft believed these supposed memories were simply the product of an overactive imagination, and argued that even the ointments themselves were completely meaningless. In the late 16th century, the French inquisitor Sébastien Michaelis 
wrote contemptuously of the idea that witches' flying ointment had any power at all, whether natural or supernatural. In his view, the ointment was a trick of the devil intended to fool the witches who communicated with him into thinking they had power. He wrote that the ointment was, quote, a compound of various idle and ineffective ingredients, such as herbs and roots, end quote, and that this mixture, quote, is not at all powerful to transport their bodies through the air from one place to another, end quote, which, he pointed out, quote, experience itself also demonstrates, end quote. Thus far, we have found no historical support for the modern belief that witches' ointments contain psychotropic compounds which gave users waking hallucinations of flight and other fantasies. Historical commentators typically believed that ointments were soporifics, which only put their users to sleep, whereupon their dreams and visions of flight and other supernatural activities would be caused either by their own fantasies or by Satan himself. Later still, some commentators believed that even the ointments themselves were completely worthless and had no physical effect on the users, whose visions were simply the product of overactive imagination. All of this is completely incongruent with the modern idea that the physical properties of the ointments had hallucinogenic effects or were deliberately used to invoke states of altered consciousness. Additionally, it is notable that even the references we do have to the active ingredients of flying ointments supposedly causing sleep come from members of the socio-economic elite speculating about the unidentified contents of ointments they had no way of analysing chemically or from common people accused of witchcraft who gave their testimonies during interrogation and sometimes under torture. There is no evidence that the common people themselves spoke or wrote of the hallucinogenic properties of ointments, or that they believed certain herbs could produce altered states of consciousness, or that any of them were deliberately using such herbs for such a purpose. Instead, the record indicates that, like other ideas concerning witchcraft during the period, these beliefs emerged from the upper levels of the social hierarchy and were transmitted downwards during the confessions and interrogations of commoners. We now come to the important issue of identifying the ingredients in which is flying ointments. There are many challenges involved here, which enthusiastic commentaries on the idea of medieval era hallucinogens typically overlook or fail to acknowledge. One is the fact that in many cases the ingredients are rarely described and often unidentifiable even when they are described. Biomeli and Bolio write of, quote, the vagueness of the records, as well as the difficulties in identifying the vegetal species mentioned, end quote. They explain that, as a result of inconsistencies in the pre-modern categorization and naming of plants, as well as changes in names over time, quote, the unambiguous botanical identification of a plant mentioned in a 16th century text is far from being straightforward. However, even when such plants are identifiable, the evidence does not support the hallucinogenic ointment theory. When we look at the ingredients for these flying ointments as recorded by the earliest sources, such as those in the 15th century, we find they aren't remotely hallucinogenic or psychotropic. Sometimes they aren't even poisonous. Ersling writes they, quote, contain either non-psychoactive magical ingredients, end quote, or are made from, quote, abominable, transgressive, inversionary materials, end quote, such as human blood and the fat of murdered babies. The infamous Malius Maleficarum, a horrifically misogynist witch-hunting manual written in 1487, claims the flying ointment was made, quote, from the body parts of children, end quote, but says nothing about it containing any plant ingredients which could have had psychotropic properties. Previously, we looked at a case of a miller and his wife accused of witchcraft on the basis of an ointment found in their house. The husband was tortured and found dead in his cell the next day. The prosecutor concluded he had been killed by the devil. When questioned about the ointment and threatened with torture, the miller's wife insisted it was a simple balm to soothe their hands after work. However, after being tortured, the wife said that the ointment had been given to her by Satan and was used to rub on a pitchfork with which she could then fly physically after saying a magical charm. The fact that this later testimony was extracted under torture suggests that it was an idea introduced by the interrogator. Prior to their arrest, the miller and his wife may not even have heard of flying ointment, 
which typically appears only in the written records of the social elites who examined accused witches. It is obvious that the ointment in this case was, as Clifton describes it, a common salve of the era, quote, used as a general pain medicine, as aspirin is today, end quote. In fact, Andreas de Laguna, cited previously, who actually investigated this case, believed this ointment was similar to the unguentum populeum, or common ointment, a mildly narcotic salve used widely throughout the medieval era. Over the centuries, many different formulations of this salve can be found, but most of them are very similar. In his 2016 book, Dictionary of Medical Vocabulary in English, 1375-1550, Dr. Juhani Nori of Tampere University in Finland identifies the main active ingredient as, quote, leaves of plants with narcotic properties, for example, henbane, black nightshade, end quote. As we have seen, these plants are commonly listed as ingredients in various kinds of witch's ointment, including flying ointment. But, as we have already seen, medieval and renaissance investigators of witch's ointments typically identified these compounds as soporifics and anesthetics, not as hallucinogens. If Laguna believed the ointment he found was unguentum populeum, then it is no surprise he believed it was a tranquilizer, not a hallucinogen, since the unguentum populeum was used as an anaesthetic. Piomerli and Polio quote from the medical treatise De Fistula in Anno by the 14th century English surgeon John Arden, who provides a recipe for the unguentum populeum and describes it as, quote, a sleeping ointment with which, if any man be anointed, he shall be able to withstand cutting in any place of the body without feeling or aching, end quote. In this particular recipe, the primary active ingredients are mandrake, henbane and hemlock, all used by the Greeks for their sedative properties. This is clearly intended to be an anaesthetic or soporific, not a hallucinogen. So even if the ointment described by Laguna was the unguentum populeum, it is extremely unlikely to have produced any hallucinogenic effect. Sarah Penica's 2002 article, Caveat Anointa, a study of flying ointments and their plants, notes that out of the ingredients commonly attributed to which is flying ointments, quote, only deadly nightshade and possibly hemlock are truly hallucinogenic, and these are also highly toxic, end quote. She adds that although aconite is commonly listed as an ingredient, it is not hallucinogenic, and notes that, quote, neither henbane, mandrake, nor datura were used in flying ointments, though all three are hallucinogenic, end quote. Of course, there are good reasons for the emission of datura and mandrake. Neither are indigenous European plants, and they were only introduced to Europe later, though mandrake was known to the ancient Greeks. However, Penica rightly notes, quote, there seems to be no good reason why henbane, which came to be associated with witches at a later stage, was not mentioned at this point, end quote. It is significant that many recipes of flying ointments contain no reference to any psychotropic compounds, not even to the European plants which could have had a hallucinogenic effect. As we have seen, at this time these plants had a reputation as poisons, anesthetics or soporifics, but not as hallucinogens. Penica suggests that plants such as nightshade were associated with witches, quote, not because they were widely regarded as hallucinogenic, but simply because they were deadly, end quote adding that this would explain, quote, why some of the herbs turned up in flying ointments, while other, more effective possibilities did not, end quote. Penica cites the mandrake's arrival in England in 1562, though she notes its reputation for strange properties and association with magic was already known by some members of the literate elite, who would have learned of it through Greek and Latin classical texts. However, she also notes that by the time mandrake was being grown in England, Practical herbalists did not think much of it at all. Penica quotes the Great Herbal, a large compendium of herbal knowledge published in 1526 by the English herbalist John Gerard, cited previously, who scoffed at common stories of the mandrake's powers, calling them, quote, ridiculous tales, end quote. Consequently, Penica says, although mandrake is found as an ingredient in recipes for the unguentum populeum and some which is poisons, even before the plant arrived in Europe, it was, quote, not included in flying ointments, no doubt for reasons of accessibility, end quote. It seems that mandrake was not associated with flying ointments until the 17th century, during the decline of the early modern witch hunts, 
And of course, once again, we find it in the writings of members of the literate elite rather than in the accounts of common people. Finally, Penica cites aconite recorded as an ingredient in flying ointments. Historically, this was called monkshood, helmet flower, or wolfsbane. However, Penica notes it was, quote, not a known hallucinogen, end quote, and, quote, probably mentioned in flying ointments because it was extraordinarily deadly, end quote. In his 2016 article, Baby Fat and Belladonna, which is ointment and the contestation of reality, Michael Ersling provides a comprehensive 11-page list of 53 historical recipes for ointments associated with witches. Although many are cited as flying ointments in historical sources, the ingredients reveal that many of them are simply various formulations of the mundane unguentum populeum, some of them are clearly poisonous, and very few of them contain any ingredients which could be considered even remotely hallucinogenic. Conclusion Erstling writes that, quote, Every few years, someone sits out to show that the alleged flight of accused witches can best be explained via an examination of the hallucinogenic properties of the supposed witch's ointment, end quote. As we have seen, research by Erstling himself and other scholars demonstrates there is no solid evidence for this. Penneker comments that, quote, there is a strong case to be made for such ointments being no more real than the Black Sabbath itself, end quote. In particular, Erstling's exhaustive research into historical records of ointments either identified specifically as flying ointments, or even more loosely associated with witches, reveals that the theory which identifies flying ointments as hallucinogenic compounds, taken either deliberately or unwittingly, is not well founded. In his own words, quote, We have no strong evidence that any early modern alleged witch ever smeared herself with a hallucinogenic ointment. End quote. The next video in this series will examine how the modern hallucinogen theory emerged, how it changed after suffering sustained academic criticism, and how some scholars have attempted to revive it. Finally, I'd like to thank my generous patrons Elias Asfig, Duran Barnett, Alexander Curzon, Sean A. Young, Andy Chaos, Tibby LTP, Thors, Niels Rethlin, Judge Sabo, Matthew Simrall, Thomas Leonard, Martin T, Ben Lindquist, John Larkin, Jack C, Ezekiel Stacy, Love You More, Noah French, Aaron Johnson, and Dusty Bob. Please contact me directly if I ever pronounce your name wrong. Thank you.